Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. Today, the man who ended the American involvement in the Iraq war showed little appetite for rejoining that war already in progress. From President Barack Obama, no reinvasion of Iraq. We will not be sending U.S. troops back into combat in Iraq, but I have asked my national security team to prepare a range of other options that could help support Iraq security forces, and I'll be reviewing those options in the days ahead. The president did leave the door open to airstrikes, the efficacy of which we will discuss in a moment. But the recent chaos in Iraq has created the opportunity for a chorus of voices, some of whom have been wrong on Iraq for years, to advance a line that manages to cast blame for the horrible violence of the radical group ISIS and the overreach of the al-Maliki government on the person that conservatives love most to blame, and that is Barack Obama. The fact is we had the conflict won and we had a stable government and a residual force such as we have left behind. We even have forces in Bosnia, Korea, Germany, Japan, where we could have, but the president wanted out and now we are paying a very heavy price. There's no question President Obama wanted to get out of Iraq totally when he should have left a small force of Americans, special forces to prop up the Iraqi army. He's been against it from, from the get-go, and now he's forced to acknowledge yeah. that the terrorists there are a threat to the United States of America, something George Bush was well, saying all along. It's, it's kind of like, you know, we just left there and crossed our fingers, and we're like, oh, hopefully nothing will happen. There's an argument echoed by New York Times columnist David Brooks today, who cast blame for current events at the feet of the president. The dangers of American underreach have been lavishly and horrifically displayed. The idea that unites all this is that Barack Obama cut and run. He pulled American troops out of Iraq too fast before the job was done, leaving it vulnerable to be overrun by marauding terrorists. Here's why I don't buy it. One, ISIS, the group that is overrunning much of Iraq right now, is largely a creation of the Iraq war itself. ISIS's, ISIS's previous iteration was Al-Qaeda in Iraq, a group that gained strength and training and numbers in the midst of the cauldron of violence that was unleashed by the Iraq war and the occupation, particularly the brutal violence in 2004 and 2005. If you want to identify the American policy choice that caused the current turmoil and violence, the single best candidate is the decision to invade and occupy Iraq under false pretenses, full stop. Number two, any residual U.S. force we might have still left in Iraq would have been minimal and in a non-combat role, somewhere on the order of two to 3,000. Keep in mind that what happened in Mosul three days ago was that 30,000 Iraqi troops turned and fled in the face of 800 fighters. Those troops were, it appears, largely Sunnis who had no desire to risk their lives for what they view as a completely Shiite-dominated government hostile to their interests. It is deeply unclear that leaving a residual force of American military trainers could have done anything to prevent this eventuality. Number three, we could not have stayed unless the Iraqi government let us stay. Iraq is a sovereign nation, and the al-Maliki government wanted American troops to leave, and negotiations to keep a residual force there beyond 2011 broke down. But Iraq considered keeping two to 3,000 beyond that, a safeguard in case the civil war returned. But Iraqi politicians, especially Shiite hardliner Muqtad al-Sadr, refused to grant the troops immunity, so they're not staying. So while critics might second guess the Obama administration's negotiating strategy, the fact remains, it was not just up to us whether we left troops, a residual force in Iraq. And number four, the status of forces agreement, the basic framework upon which American withdrawal was based, came from the administration of President George W. Bush. The status of forces agreement negotiated over months, approved by a new Iraqi parliament, was signed by President Bush and Iraqi President Nouri al-Maliki just a month before the first inauguration of President Obama. It might have even gotten some decent news coverage on President Bush's final trip to Iraq, except it was overshadowed by this. President Bush and the Iraqi Prime Minister were about to take reporters' questions when an Iraqi television reporter hurled a shoe, a grave insult in Arab culture. The president wasn't hurt and seemed amused. It's a size 10 shoe that he threw. The Obama administration certainly does not have a perfect record in its Iraq policy, but to point fingers at this president, years after the Pandora's box of horror was unleashed on Iraq, is pretty craven. Joining me now, Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, who is a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And Senator, I've heard a lot of casting blame. I've heard a lot of arguments about uh, the precipitous withdrawal of the Obama administration. What I have not heard are many constructive ideas about what to do. 
No, and that's sort of par for the course, is that as the world gets more chaotic, it must be President Obama's fault. Um, and, you know, the, the David Brooks criticism this morning is pretty rich because he actually agrees with President Obama's strategy. President Obama wanted to leave a force behind, but he couldn't do that without legal protection. And after the fact, it's convenient to say that the difference is really just that uh, President Obama should have tried harder. The reality is, is that had we stayed an additional uh, six months or six years, the underlying problem was not going to go away, which is that al-Maliki is concerned much more with seeking vengeance on his Sunni rivals than he is uniting a country. And you put it, I think, very well. You know, when I break an egg on the floor, whether I spend um, 10 minutes or 10 hours trying to clean it up, I can't put it back together. Right. Um, that egg is broken. And that essentially is what we did when we invaded Iraq, whether we stayed with an additional 3,000 troops it wasn't going to solve those deep divisions. It, it also strikes me that the, 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 the brutal, violent, vicious civil war uh, that broke out 2004-2005, that the surge, quote, fixed, right? The surge was a success. That the, the issues that are manifesting themselves right now are just manifestations of the same issues of sectarian strife, of sidelining of the Sunni uh, minority, which feels uh, separated from the power of the state and unrecognized. All of that was the stuff the surge was supposed to fix. So if it's Coming back now, it's as much a repudiation of the, quote, victory of the surge as anything else. Yeah, and, and remember, the, the surge um, was fueled in part by massive American payouts to right. a lot of the Sunni insurgents to get them back on board. And um, when those payouts ended, along, frankly, with the massive military involvement that was not going to be open-ended, um, a lot of the, the advancements of the surge um, did dissipate. That was inevitable. And the reality is, is that we have been begging Maliki uh, for years now to get serious about building a real government. He is not serious about it. Now, that doesn't mean that we should sit on our hands idly as these radicals move into the country. I I'm going to be listening to President Obama as he uh, potentially proposes some limited military action. And if that does come in coordination with some assurances from Maliki that he's going to change his internal politics, then I think that there's lots of us who will listen to that case. Um, but the reality is, is that for all of these folks that are just trying to say that this is Obama's fault, it ignores the fact that Maliki is the one really to blame here. Finally, what is the mood on Capitol Hill right now? I mean, you're among your colleagues. It doesn't seem to me that there's any kind of consensus as there seem to be a little bit more on, say, Ukraine and Crimea, where there seems a stronger push from the Hill in a bipartisan fashion. We've seen that in Syria uh, in terms of reluctance against the airstrikes. What, do you sense any consensus among your colleagues? Uh, no, I don't. But right now, I do think that there is relative openness to listening to the president's recommendations. And I do hope that he takes a few days to make them. But um, I think that the one lesson that uh, most of us have learned from 10 years of misadventures in Iraq and Afghanistan is that the United States is pretty miserable at trying to um, maneuver yep. and orchestrate politics on the ground in the Middle East. And so there is, uh, whether it's confusion or a general chilled reaction to increased intervention is due to the fact that the one lesson that we have learned is that um, the United States normally, when we try to intervene to change the realities on the ground in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, make things worse, not better. Ain't that the truth? Senator Chris Murphy, Democrat of Connecticut, thank you. Joining me now, Rajiv Kandasekaran, associate editor with The Washington Post, author of an incredible book about Iraq, uh, reported from Iraq for years in the midst of the conflict. Having been there during the, some of the worst points of the conflict, how are you understanding and perceiving what's happening now? Look, Chris, this is just, as, as I see it, uh, the, the latest grim chapter in a, in a series of uh, bad decisions made by Iraqi leaders set in motion by bad decisions made by the United States. I mean, all this has its roots, of course, in the decision to invade Iraq, uh, but then in, in those decisions made in those fateful uh, days after we got there, you know, disbanding the Ba'ath Party, uh, disbanding the Iraqi army, uh, essentially turning uh, uh, the, the, the two major groups in Iraqi society against each other. Look, they had always been in conflict, Chris, and you know this very well, um, but uh, what we did was uh, exactly the opposite of trying to promote reconciliation, and over the following years, uh, we would continue to make these mistakes, and, you know, we talked about the surge uh, with Senator Murphy. I mean, look, we, 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 we 
certain people in the United States took, took the wrong lesson from it, uh, thinking that the reduction in violence was the um, as essentially uh, uh, the mark of a job well done. Right. Well, the surge was only half done. We didn't get to the fundamental political compromise, and we're seeing the consequences of that play out today. Do you think, um, well, first of all, what do you think would uh, alter what's happening right now? I mean, is there any kind of leverage? Is there anything to do? People say, well, we have to have a political solution. The Maliki government has to get serious about bringing in, the, in, you know, bringing in the Sunni minority, making them feel integrated to the Iraqi state. But there's no evidence that there's any incentive or desire to do that. This is someone who has spent his life and career essentially as part of a, a Shiite party who's, who's committed himself to waging war and, and, and running a state on behalf um, of a long oppressed uh, majority, we should note. What is there to be done? Well, look, there's only so much Maliki, I think, can do and is willing to do. We have to be realistic about that. But I think what, what President Obama uh, talked about today may be the most sensible strategy going forward, which is to try to use the, the prospect of U.S. airstrikes as a, as a forcing function to finally get Maliki serious about trying to uh, reach out to the Sunni minority. And, and maybe uh, when he is faced with, with an with a existential crisis like this, where, where his personal survival and that of his government is on the line, perhaps he will start to take some actions that he hasn't done thus far. But I, I wouldn't expect overnight Maliki to turn into the, to the great conciliator, the big tent leader uh, of Iraq. Um, uh, but hopefully we can try to get at least some affirmative steps that then lead some of these Sunnis to, to try to reject uh, the, uh, the al-Qaeda militants that have stormed into their country, try to get sort of a, a second Sunni awakening. Yes. Yes, of course, the best ally for that is the, is the sheer depravity of, of, of ISIS and what they have done in the towns which they have entered, which, as we saw with uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq and Zarqawi back in the middle of the last decade, quickly alienated a lot of the people uh, that were subject to it. Rajiv Chandrasekharan from The Washington Post, thank you so much. Good to talk to you. All right. Up next. Nobody has an interest in seeing terrorists gain a foothold inside of Iraq, and nobody is going to benefit from seeing Iraq descend into chaos. So the United States will do our part, but understand that ultimately it's up to the Iraqis as a sovereign nation to solve their problems. Boots on the ground are out, thankfully. So what is in and will it make any difference at all? That's next.